Hello everyone. Good evening. Thanks for joining us on a Friday night for uh, Father David's uh, talk. Um, uh, tonight we will be talking about the uh, morality of the sexual act. Um, and uh, this talk is jointly organized by Catholic Family Life, which is the umbrella body for a lot of the uh, family ministries under the Archdiocese in Singapore, and also for the, uh, mar the marriage preparation course. Um, and so before we start, I'd just like to say a few words about Father to introduce him. Um, I think a lot of you know uh, who he is, and uh, well, Father uh, has been uh, in Singapore for I think more than 15 years? 20? 20 years. <laughs> okay, so he's from Spain, and uh, he's a moral theologian, and he's a professor at uh, the major seminary in Singapore, and also the Catholic Theological Institute of Singapore. So um, he's a very sought after speaker, and so we are very fortunate to have him uh, give us uh, this talk this week, and also there's another talk next week on the morality of fertility. Right. So um, uh, thank you, Father. I think we are very fortunate to have him. Um, please so put your hand together to welcome Father. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we need prayers. Let us begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Almighty Father, we bless you for bringing us here tonight. We ask you to bless each one of us with the power of your Holy Spirit, especially with the power of understanding. You know how much we need that understanding to comprehend the depth of your truth and also the courage to put all this truth into practice in our own lives and also to be truthful witnesses of that truth for the world. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Okay, uh, can you see me? Do I have to be taller? Okay. <coughs> uh, so, uh, why are we here? We are here because of me. <laughs> um, I typically do ministries that have to do with morality, okay. and sexuality is part of that. And lots of people ask me the question, why the church says that contraception is wrong? Why the church says that masturbation is wrong? Why the church says that premarital sex is wrong? And I always keep quiet and not answer, which seems a bit strange because isn't that my job? Okay. Uh, yes, it is my job, but uh, I think we don't think enough. We talk about sex a lot. Uh, we don't think enough and we shouldn't speak before we think. So today, uh, next week, we will think about fertility. Today, we are going to think about sex and what it entails. So as I said before, uh, why why my clicker doesn't work? Okay. Uh, first of all, no answer is better than a bad answer. And I don't want to give bad answers. Uh, today I will try to explain everything I think we should know in two hours. If you give me the time I need, uh, it will be 14 hours. But nobody gives me that time anymore. So I said, okay, let us at least two hours. So this is the reason why I don't want to give an answer in five minutes because it will be a bad answer. Why are bad answers bad or worse than no answer? Okay, typical reaction sometimes, uh, good, willing catechist, people in ministry say, oh, why is, I don't know, contraception wrong? Why is, I don't know, premarital sex wrong? And say, oh, because sex is for procreation. And therefore, every time you have sex and you remove the procreation bit out of that, uh, then you are not doing it for the purpose it was created. And that sounds kind of okay. Of course, people who are a bit critical will say, what? Uh, that doesn't work. Okay, what are my hands for? Certainly grabbing things, right? My feet are for walking. That's pretty clear, right? So if I start walking on my hands, do I commit a mortal sin? This argument is as old as the hill. So Thomas Aquinas, in the 13th century, a while ago, <laughs> uh, used that argument. That is not a sufficient argument, because we change the purpose of things all the time. So why is it bad, or why it is better, I think, to keep quiet than, rather than giving a, a bad answer? Because when people are not convinced by your answer, they will say, oh, the church doesn't have good answers. And at that point, they stop asking anymore. So this argument that uh, the church, the sex is for procreation, and therefore you can only use it for that, I mean, it is true, sex is for procreation. 
one of the goals, one of the ends of sex. But you don't complete the argument because there is a counter argument. As, as a matter of fact, this argument is as old as the hills, as I said, and it has a name in the church and it's called physicalism. If you want to know more about that, read what the St. John uh, Paul II had to say about that. So, yeah, it doesn't work. Um, and then you have another argument, which is, oh, the church says so, the Pope says so, the Bible says so, depending on what kind of Christian you are. And it is not a good argument either, because if the church says so, there must be a reason why the church says so. If God says so, there must be a reason why God says so. If I tell you that murder is wrong, it is quite obvious why it is wrong. And it doesn't matter whether God says that or not, because if it is wrong, then God should say it is wrong. So the argument of authority is not a very good argument either. And what, as I said before, why is this bad? Because it vaccinates people against the gospel. One of the reasons why I humbly think that Europe is losing or has lost its faith is precisely because of this. There has been no serious formation in the faith. And therefore, when people have bad answers to good questions, they will say, okay, I know what you are going to say. I heard all your teachings when I was a seven-year-old boy in catechesis, and those are fairy tales for children, and I know they don't work. Why? We don't have formation that goes beyond seven years old. The last time anybody went to formation was formation for the first communion, or for confirmation, which they were, I don't know what, 11, 12, something like that. Uh, so, there are good answers, but by the time people are ready for the good answers, they are not in the church anymore, and we don't have a space for formation in the faith. Every Catholic out there ex expects their formation in the faith to come from the homilies, which would be a very bad homily. Homilies are not meant to be catechesis, homilies are not meant to be for formation, homilies are not meant to explain why abortion is wrong and premarital sex is wrong, homilies are supposed to be part of the liturgy and they are supposed to be like mini skirts, short and revealing. <laughs> so it is not the time to explain in detail things like this and we don't have spaces like this. So I'm very lucky that I have this opportunity uh, to have the space and hopefully the time to consider this a bit more seriously. So, um, you have heard this, or oh, why the church says it is totally unreasonable, masturbation is wrong, who believes that? Okay, so let me get an easier answer, uh, well, an easier question rather. So how many people here think that prostitution is morally wrong? Raise your hands. Okay, many, uh, how many people think that let us do the other way around. How many people think that prostitution is morally okay? It's okay that we are not going to, the camera is not facing you, you can be free to choose whatever you want. Uh, nobody, seriously? First of all, let us phrase the, the, the question properly. Because some people say, oh, I don't mind if my neighbor is a prostitute. Yeah, of course you don't mind because you don't care about her. But that's not a moral question. The question is, so, all of is to will the good for the other, right? So, if you think that prostitution is not bad, you wouldn't mind someone you love to be a prostitute. That's the authentic position. So, if you tell me, nobody here tells me, that you think that prostitution is okay, you, should, you have to be consistent and you should say, I don't mind if my mother, my daughter, my sister is one. So, that is the question. So, let me... Ask the question again. Anybody here thinks that prostitution is morally permissible? Morally? If you cut away the word morally, then it's more arguable. Cut <laughs> no, but we are here to talk about the morality of these things. So I cannot cut it off because then I finish the talk and we go home and it's too early. So <laughs> morality is what we are here to talk about. So is morally permissible? Okay. Let me introduce you. Uh, Sophia Yusuf. So long, long, long time ago, she was a very clever girl. When she was 11, she went to 13. She went to Oxford for her talents in mathematics. See, that was not her only talent. She became an escort at 23, and she earned a lot, $360 an hour. Escorts, high-class prostitute, okay? So this is what he had to say about that. We are going to trust her. She's an expert in these matters. She says, people think being an escort is horribly 
morally wrong, okay? Sleazy, terrible, but I don't see it like that. So she doesn't agree with you, okay? Um, I have always had a high sex drive, and now I'm getting all the sex I want, and guys are much better in bed with an escort than with a girlfriend. I didn't know that, okay? Um, Uh, her clients treat her like a princess. One of them bought her a beautiful black Gucci dress, 700 pounds, not bad. Let me put this into perspective, okay? So uh, I'm a priest. Nobody bought me a Gucci dress for 700 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, don't do that, okay? So, but you get my point, right? That this is not just a commercial relationship, there's this She's so good at it that the clients go the extra mile and are willing to be extra nice to her. All right? Okay. So, but you disagree with her, all of you here, right? I ask the question again. Anybody thinks that this is okay? No? You all think that this is morally wrong? Why? Yes, yes, Because I wouldn't want my mother or my wife or anyone related to me to do that. Why? Because they are trading themselves as a commodity for money. Okay, that's an interesting idea. Don't we do that all the time? I mean, if you are a footballer, what do you use to earn money? Your legs, right? You keep, you keep kicking a piece of leather for one hour plus in shorts, and you get a lot of money for that, if you are pretty good at that. Aren't you treating yourself as a commodity, earning a living? That's, isn't that what everybody who works in a job actually do? Okay, you ask her about her dignity, she will say, hey, I have this talent and I am very dignified in putting my talent to a good use. Clients are very happy. I earned good money. I don't see anything wrong with that. She doesn't believe in God. So that's another thing. So once again, what I, I said before, uh, when Catholics feel that oh, I don't have an argument, they quickly remember, oh my goodness, I'm Catholic. I can bring God into the picture and then I can, I can, I can solve the problem quite, quite quickly. First of all, she may say, I don't believe in God, I am not a child of God, I am just a child of my parents. Second, even if she believes in God, that wouldn't be a good argument, because she said, precisely because I am a child of God and God has blessed me with this talent and these capacities, I want to make people happy. And she's very good at that. What lies uh, the body telling? It's also against the, uh, the, the agreement of the, the marriage law. She's single. <laughs> <laughs> and just in case you, you wonder, she's an ethical prostitute. She only takes single clients. Okay, uh, I cannot. Okay, so we conclude prostitution is morally okay. Yes? For the uh, sex is for married couples. Uh, why? God made it that way. Once again, God made it that way. <laughs> what if she doesn't believe in God? Is it sex is for whatever you want to make of it. If married people want to have sex, good for them. I want to have sex to earn money, good for me. But who said that and why? In the Bible? <laughs> she doesn't believe in the Bible. So that's the argument uh, by authority. So if, think about, 
if I ask you why is murder wrong, do you need to quote the Bible to say why murder, murder is wrong? So why, when it comes to sex, we quickly go to the Bible in, uh, I don't know what to, okay, so any last call? So hereby we declare prostitution is morally okay. <laughs> yes. The point you're talking about the girl single, right? Yeah. It's not sacred and holy for her. It's not? Sacred and holy, although she's single. Yeah. Why is not sacred and holy? I, okay. Sacred and holy. When she plays chess, does chess need to be sacred and holy to do it? So why prostitution needs to be, or sex needs to be sacred and holy, and chess doesn't need to be sacred and holy? And you can play chess for recreation, and you can play sex for recreation? Because this involves the body. Yeah, footballers involve the body as well. <laughs> Is football <laughs> holy and sacred? Be oh, the intimacy between two people, I cannot hear you. Uh, I mean, for example, she doesn't uh, have sex with football. Football is a sport that involves one person to the other it's not necessarily, it does not carry the weight that comes with intimacy and what is shared in the So family. what is that, okay, very good. What is that weight of intimacy? And why does the weight matter if it matters? I mean, there's a level of vulnerability there in the sense that... I, I don't think she feels vulnerable. I think she's very safe. I think football is uh, more risky. <laughs> <laughs> Would it have anything to do? We can say that there are consequences having done an act because no matter whether you yourself feel that way, there could be other unintended consequences such as on a person. So for example, if you encourage the pursuit of an act of sex as a way to seek short term fulfillment, mm. over time whether you like it or not, there could be someone who resorts to, in a sense, this unhealthy way of, of pursuing momentary happiness in that sense. And so if you as a prostitute... I mean, but but is, isn't football also yeah. pursuing a momentary happiness? Uh, nobody goes to heaven because play, they play football very well. She's a very, very ethical prostitute. She asks the clients to wear two condoms each time. <laughs> she is on this. Hmm? No bad consequences. Two condoms is double protection. Very, very, very safe. She's ready to take that risk. Footballers take risks as well. Some of them break their legs or they have to do expensive surgeries. The last one, because this game is... Uh, I mean, by her actions, right, she caused other men who could be potentially married. No, no, she's an ethical prostitute, only single men. <laughs> okay, so, here we have concluded, yes. Because the conscience is not affected at all. Well, conscience, people have different consciences. Yeah, so you agree with me, finally, somebody who agrees with me. So we have concluded that prostitution is morally okay. So, what's the point of all this? Uh, enough playing for today. Um, first of all, the fact that you cannot tell me why doesn't mean that it is right. And this happens in, in, in ministry all the time. You, you have your teenager who says, why masturbation is wrong? You cannot tell me why, it means that it is okay. Just because you, you cannot tell me why, it means that, it simply means you cannot tell me why. I mean, you don't have the words, the, perhaps the grammar, the concept, the culture to say that. So let us go through this, this uh, one-on-one one logic. So there is a relationship between premises and conclusions. This is two premises, all men die, Peter is a man. Those two premises, you put them together, that is a valid conclusion. If the premises are true and the conclusion is valid, then the conclusion is true as well. That's normal logic, we, all, we are all familiar with this. Okay, regarding sex, there is another conclusion that it is in our, in our world today. And that conclusion is morality depends on the consequences of your actions. And if the consequences of your actions are good, then you should do it. If the consequences of your actions are bad, then you shouldn't do it. Which means that you can do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt anyone. That's more or less how morality works today. And I know that 
and this is what you have in your minds, and this is what you are trying to tell me. How C can, the consequences of her actions, can do something bad. But I know you are going to do that, so I cut, the, I cut your, your exit there and say, no, she's using two condoms, she only uses, uh, uh, she, she only attends to uh, single, single clients. And another premise of this conversation is that we tend to think that our body is something we have, it's part of our possessions. So you put these two premises together and the conclusion is very evident. The conclusion is valid, and therefore, if the premises are true, the conclusion is true. You can do whatever you want with your body, as long as you don't hurt anyone. That is the dogma that is playing in your heads. And as long as that dogma is playing in your heads, there is no way you can tell me what is wrong with prostitution, because she is not doing, the consequences of that action seem not to do any harm to anyone. It is consensual, the two dogmas of today, if it is consensual, and protected, then every sexual act is okay. That is what we have in our culture today, okay? So, let us conclude for now. Uh, just because you cannot say why something is wrong, it does not mean that it is right. It simply means that failure to verbalize what we truly believe may be due to the fact that they, we lack the language. Please bear in mind that all of you think here, I, I hope, that you wouldn't want your mother, your daughter, your sister to be one. It means that you really believe that, but if I ask you why, you cannot tell me, you cannot tell, give me a reason for that. So why? Because to give a reason, we need concepts, we need words, and words come in our culture. And if our culture doesn't have the words to verbalize that, you cannot possibly verbalize what you think is truly, really true. So, but let us now, now that we know what are the premises, let us question the premises. So, every culture has dogmas. Chesterton said, there are two kinds of people, people who believe, people who have dogmas, and they know where they come from. Catholics are part of those. We know which one of the Catholic dogmas come from, who put it there, and what year they were decided. And people who believe in dogmas, and they don't know where they come from, every culture, has, is dogmatic. Every culture has dogmas that are not questioned. But today, we are going to do precisely that. We are going to question these two cultural dogmas. So, the first is, number one, number one, you can do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt anyone. Let us leave the body for later. Let us deal with this now, okay? Is that true? Can you really do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt anyone? Meaning, the only boundary in morality is when you hurt other people. Okay, let us think about this. Let me give you one scenario. Some of you may be familiar with this because they have listened to me before. Okay, you are driving a train and you are a good person, let us presume, and you, are, you realize that there are five people tied to the rail track, you are going to kill them, right? But you are a good person, we said, you don't want to kill them. So you slam on the brakes, brakes don't work. You are totally horrified, you are going to kill five people, you have never killed people before, you don't know how even that, that even feels. Luckily for you, there is one track on your left. But on that track, there is one person equally tied to the rail track. Question is, what do you do? Do you turn or you don't turn? There are only two options. Please give me the answer. How many people will turn? Will turn and therefore kill one person. How many people will kill one person here? There's a lot of killers here, okay. <laughs> How many people will not turn and therefore How many people will not do anything? If you don't do anything like that, you kill five people. So two people will kill five people, the rest of you will kill one person. Okay, why? Can, can we turn the tree? No, the no they, they don't make things, we don't have time. <laughs> there are only two options, turn or not turn. Don't, you don't, you don't call anybody, you cannot say, hey, can I kill you? No, you cannot do anything, just turn or not turn. 
okay. Why you would turn, I presume? Yeah. Yeah, because. <laughs> because you are utilitarian, you think that the, the yes, less amount least amount of damage. Okay, anyone will turn for any other reason than the his utilitarian reason. It is better to kill few people than many people. Sounds like a good argument, right? Okay, so you are totally traumatized. You kill one person. You don't want to kill people anymore. So now you don't drive trains anymore. You're on a walk. You pass through this. You're going to pass through this uh, bridge. And to your horror, there is this train that is coming. The five people that you left yesterday are still there, tied to the rail track. <laughs> and this train is going to kill them. This time, you have the chance to redeem yourself. You can jump onto the tracks. The train will certainly kill you. And you will have saved these five people. If it is in my case, I just realize I am only weigh 59 kilos. There is no way I'm going to stop this train. But luckily for you, there is a fat man <laughs> there just besides you. You can push him. He will certainly fall onto the track. He will certainly stop the train. You will certainly have saved five people. OK, now you know what the question is. How many of you will push the fat man? <laughs> you. Because? Because you are the only consistent person here. You turn the train because you kill less people. You push the fat man because you kill less people. Am I reading your mind? You are not saving anyone. Let us be realistic here. <laughs> you are just killing less people. They are not safe. They're, they're, they're until, yeah. Okay. So you kill less people by pushing the fat man, right? <laughs> okay. Let it be. Okay. I give you that. So pushing the fat man is okay because you have to choose the course of action that maximizes goodness, right? So why there is only one person consistent here? The rest of you, you turn the train and you don't push the fat man. What is the difference for those who didn't listen to this before? Why are you so inconsistent? So all these two cases are very important because first of all, they were not invented by me. Um, they were invented by philosophers to point out that thinking about consequences is not as good as it looks. And here is very reflective, more or less 90% of the people will be very reluctant or will not push the fat guy. And once again, here only one person will push the fat guy. It's all this uh, uh, recalcitrant uh, utilitarians that think that morality depends on the consequences of your actions. Okay. So, but in this case, it doesn't work because the consequences are the same. In both scenarios, you act, one person is saved or alive. If you don't act, five people die. So why are you choosing a different, a different option? So, this confusion started all with Mr. Jeremy Bentham, right there in the picture in 1932. He came up with this idea of uh, making morality very simple. And he said, there is only one moral principle, the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Ever since, this is called utilitarianism, or some versions of it, consequentialism. For our sake today, we are going to call it consequentialism. It is easy to remember that it simply means that morality of an action is decided based only on the consequences of your actions. So you weigh pros and cons. This is how you do investments, benefits and burdens. If you act, then five people survive, one person dies. Net result is four people. <laughs> okay, so that sounds like a net good result. And that is why we discuss all these things in all these topics in, in morality in the world, euthanasia. Uh, why, is, why is it a, um, a controversial topic? 
Because what is the difference between killing my grandfather today without pain or waiting for him to die in pain one month later? Obviously, it seems that it is more merciful to kill him today without pain than let him endure one month of pain if he's going to die anyway. Once again, if you weigh consequences, then only as the measurement of your morality, then utilitarianism or consequentialism tells you you have to kill your uncle. Okay. Premarital sex, once again, what is the difference between having sex five minutes before the wedding and ten minutes after the wedding? Consequences are the same, so the morality should be the same. And more things that we are going to talk about. IVF, what is the difference between having a child through natural means and artificial means, the result is the same. You do spend a little bit more money in IVF, but it is worthy because what you have is a baby. It is very, very, very beneficial. A lot of goodness in that. The money is certainly worth all these benefits. And therefore, nobody in today's world will try, will dare to say that IVF is wrong because if you are a consequentialist, it is very beneficial. And of course, contraception, which we'll talk about next week. So I hope we get the point that we have this cultural blind spot that is called utilitarianism or consequentialism. And uh, people tend to think in these terms. And this is the reason why you have no idea of why prostitution is wrong. Because if you are a consequentialist, you try to tell me consequences by which uh, prostitution is wrong or bad consequences about prostitution and you cannot find many. So the question is, is this consequentialism something right or wrong? Is this premise something we should embrace? So let us think about morality as it has always been thought to. So I give you two scenarios. Scenario number one, I am driving, this man falls from a tree, there is no way, there is no way I can foresee that he was going to fall. He falls in front of my car if I had a car and I kill him if he is very dead right there. So he's very dead, his wife is very widow, and his children are very orphan. And that's very bad. Okay? We can agree on that. Second scenario, now you are very tired, I'm very confused, confusing, they're confusing you. Then you take your gun and you shoot at me. You don't kill priests very often, you're out of uh, shape, so you missed. <laughs> Nobody saw you shooting. So I turn around, and I think you're my friend, you're I think you are still a good person. Which one of these two is worse, morally speaking? The word morally is important here. This is the easy question. Everybody should have the easy answer. You don't need to think about that. Which one is worse, morally speaking? Attempted murder or accidental killing? <laughs> and this is something everybody agrees. Every legislation, every religion, every culture out there agrees that attempted murder is worse, morally speaking, than accidental killing. Why? Is it because of the consequences? Which consequences are worse? Certainly, the consequences of accidental killing are far worse than the consequences of intended uh, uh, attempted murder. So what is the factor that affects this decision? Tension. Tension. Nice try, not good enough. Why? Because if we go back, to the two scenarios of the train, the intention is the same. Consequences are the same. You save five people, you kill one person. The intention is the same. The intention is to save or not to kill five people. So nice try, not good enough. Can we do better than this? Let us. But we have to ask ourselves why the intention matters. And the reason why the intention matters is because our decisions change us. This is the most important idea I want to emphasize today because utilitarianism doesn't think about this. And it is a real idea. The moment you decided to kill me, you became a murderer in your heart. And that is a real change. So real that the, if the judge finds out, you go to jail. Why? Because the moment you made yourself a person capable of killing another person or murdering another person, you are now in fact, dangerous to society. You have changed yourself. That change is the moral change. The moral change is not the consequences of your actions, how the, how the consequences of your actions change the world. 
What morality is really all about is how we change ourselves through our decisions. And without this, we cannot have and we cannot build a right, healthy morality. So morality doesn't just depend on what we do, it depends on what we want to do. And now we are on a track to something a bit more. But for, for that, we need to understand the anatomy of a decision. So what are the elements of every decision out there? Something very simple. All decisions have these three components, the means to your, to your, to your intention, the intention with which you do it, and the consequences or the side effects of what you are doing. Something very simple, if I want to buy groceries, I have to come out of my room, I have to take the bus, have to go to NTUC and buy my groceries. All these are means to the goal. Clear? Then are side effects of my actions. Maybe I contaminate the environment because I take the bus, I spend money because I have to take the bus, maybe I save my life because a tree suddenly fell there and I escaped just in time, Maybe I happen to see my friend. All these will be side effects of my actions, some of them totally unpredictable. Yes? Okay, so those are the elements of the action. Which of these elements is fundamental? We said that morality depends on you, what you want to do. And this distinction is crucial. We want two things. We not only want our intention, we also want the means to our intention. Let me explain how this comes about. So Aristotle has this famous example. He says, the boat is about to sink, there is a storm, and the captain thinks that the only way to save the boat and the crew and everybody in the boat is to throw the cargo overboard. So do you think that he wants to throw the cargo overboard? Is this an intentional action? Throw the cargo overboard. What do you think? Yes or no? No? Yes? How many people say yes? How many people say no? How many people are already sleeping? Okay. Let me put it in this, in this, in this way, right? You are, uh, one of the sailors goes to the captain and says, Captain, the boat is sinking. Do you want me to throw the cargo overboard? What is the captain? What does the captain have to say? Yes, I want you to throw the cargo overboard. This distinction is crucial because what it means is that we not only want the intentions of our actions, we also want the means of our actions. You're gonna say, oh, I just want to save the boat. I don't want to throw the cargo. If you don't want to throw the cargo, then you are not going to attain your goal. You are not going to attain your intention. So this is, as, once again, this is as old as the hills of Aristotle in the fourth century before Christ. And this distinction is crucial because now we can solve the problem. Now we know why, and this is the important bit. I hope you get this much, okay? Now we know why most of you wouldn't dare to push the fat guy. This is the same thing as, the, as the, the, the case of prostitution. In your heart, you know very well that you don't want anyone you love to be a prostitute. In your heart, you know very well that you didn't dare to push the fat man. It is just like sounds very hard to verbalize why you don't push the fat man and you, within, you would turn the train. And the reason is because when you turn the train, you can tell yourself, I don't want to kill anybody. I know I will kill somebody, but I don't want to kill them. And therefore, if morality depends on what you want, then you will be excused of this unwanted death. I hope it makes sense. Let me try to verbalize that. Can we be sure about this? Let us imagine this scenario. You turn the train. This poor guy sees the train coming. He panics. He gets this superhuman strength, breaks the chains, and runs away. How do you feel? You feel happy, you feel relieved. Why do you feel relieved? Because your will has been fulfilled. Your wants have been fulfilled. Which proves me that you really don't want this man to be killed. If he's going to be killed, it's a side effect of your good action of turning the train. So in this case, killing the man is not intentional. It's not something you want. It's something you tolerate as a side effect of your action. 
Is this permissible? That is absolutely yes. Why? Because of every good action that we have, or actually of every action, there will be many side effects, some of them good, some of them bad. There is no way we can escape this. The world is complicated. Even when Jesus did something good, something bad happened after that. We have no choice. The world is complicated. For every one good action that we do, there will be, hopefully, the good intention that follows after, but many other side effects, some of them bad. Many of you came here driving. Do you want to pollute Singapore? Congratulations, you did. <laughs> Ask yourself, do you want to do it? Because you are going to go back. <laughs> you, are to, you, can, you have to tell yourself, I know I will contaminate Singapore. I also know that I don't want to contaminate Singapore. And in order to attain a very nice talk, <laughs> I have to tolerate this bad side effect of my action, and that is justified. We need to justify that. So this is a proof. We know why you turn the train. Can we apply this to the second scenario? Can we see if this pushing the fat man is wanted or not wanted? Is this an unwanted side effect? Is pushing the fat man, is killing the fat man an unwanted side effect of your actions? What do you think? Let us put it to the test. You push the fat man, fat man is very fat, he bounces off the track. <laughs> what do you have to do? <laughs> if you want to pursue your same intention, what you have to do is run down very fast, roll the fat man back <laughs> onto the tracks, and wait for the train to hit him. You cannot tell yourself, I don't want the fat man to be hit by the train. That would be totally illogical. And this is the difference, I hope you see it, between the fat man and the other one. The pushing the fat man is the means to save the five people. And the means are intended, are wanted. You cannot say, I don't want the fat man to be hit by the train. That would be a lie. And therefore, this is why, and this, you all know this, you don't, perhaps you don't know how to explain it because you don't think about fat man in trains very often, but this is exactly what is happening. Okay, so I hope that's, uh, so we are in this, uh, now we know that we are in this uh, crossroad on the, on your, this is the most trodden path. If you are consequentialist, the greatest happiness for the greatest number, only consequences, con consequences count. So just weigh consequences and the end justifies the means. If you are a crude consequentialist, then you have to push the far guy. But there is an alternative, which is what matters most is what we want to do. And therefore, we can formulate something. We should not want wrong means to attain good ends. The end does not justify the means. Hitler had good intentions too. So lessons from the fat man, OK, before we take a break. The moral cultural dogma is you can do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt anyone. We live in a culture that likes consequentialist morality. And when it does not suit us, then we come up with the idea, oh, the church says so, obligation morality, the Bible says so, like in the case of prostitution. But morality depends on what we want to do. As long as we understand that, then we have a good foundation of morality. Some bad side effects of our good actions need to be tolerated, even to the extent that some people may be killed. If you want to build a highway, you know that some people will be killed in the highway. You build a hospital, you know somebody will die in that hospital. And we still build highways and hospitals because it's better to have a hospital that will save many lives, even if some lives will be lost. And it is better to have a highway that makes our lives more convenient, even if we can predict that some people will die because we, those deaths are not wanted deaths and are justified because they are side effects of our good actions. So that gives us a better dogma, which is we should never want to do evil, but we should tolerate unintended, unwanted badness. Does it make sense? So we have passed the first dogma. So we should never want to do evil, neither as an end or as a means. And that is exactly what the church teaches. But I don't need to quote the church because we can find that out just thinking about fat men. Okay. 
Number two. So now we know that there was a dogma, and now uh, we have kind of what if that dogma is wrong and we adopt the opposite, which is morality does not depend on consequences, depends on what we want to do. Okay. Number two is the body. Okay. Um, that the body is something we have, and that is very popular. It works like this. You think that uh, there are two things about us. We have body and mind, and my, your mind is who you are, your emotions, your intentions, your plans for the future, all these wonderful things that make you who you are, your memories of the past. And then you have your body, which is like the machine that executes all these actions. So if you love somebody, your mind is the one that loves, and then your body executes that action. Okay. Is that, is that does that, does that sound reasonable? Yes, it sounds reasonable because there was a French guy in the 17th century that invented that. And ever since, we all have bought that idea without critical thinking. This is exactly how he put it. More obviously longer than this, but he said, our bodies are just like machines. And our mind is really who we are. I can, I can be myself without my body. That idea is explored in Avatar, for example. You go to this planet, you cannot go there because you die, so you transfer yourself into the body of this creature. You're still you, right? Why you're still you? Because you are not your body. You are just borrowing the body of this creature. What makes you you is not the body, it's your ideas, your plans, your actions, your intentions, all these things. So he was so keen on this that he thought that the only connection between the body and the mind was the pineal gland. Today we know that this is 17th century rubbish, that it has no basis in science, and we know that the pineal gland has better things to do. <coughs> but still, that idea of our bodies, that perception of our bodies as the machines of our minds, is still ingrained in, in our culture. And the consequences of that are a tremendous precisely in sexuality. So, let me, what if we change this? Let me propose another version. Okay, and then you have to choose between Descartes or myself. So, okay, so this is what I'm proposing that in ourselves there are depths of, of, of meaningfulness. So think about these three, to be in love, to be annoyed and to be bored. There are three kind of uh, emotions. Are they the same? Which one do you think is deeper? If I ask you, what do you think is deeper, to be in love or to be bored? Which one is more relevant for you? Most probably will say to be in love is more relevant, it's a bit deeper. How about actions like shaking hands, hugs, and holding hands? Which one of the three do you think is a bit deeper, a bit more meaningful? So probably you choose along, uh, according to the arrows. All these arrows are just for to, for to make you think. Because I'm going to ask you a question. You think about body parts, hands, shoulders, sexual organs will be somewhere, somewhere, somewhere. Okay, where would you put your body? Now that you know how this works in this spiral, that there are levels of depth, where would you put your body? You would put, let, let us be scientific here, so that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten layers of depth. How many people would put their body in layer number one? Nobody. In number two? One person. In number three? One person. Number four? Hello. Number five? Number six? Seven? Eight? Nine? Nine, one person, nine, nine and a half, two, three people, Num ten, eleven. Hello, choose one. Okay. I like your idea. Let us let us let us use his idea. No? So let us let us use his idea, right? That the body is not one layer, it goes all around the same layer. Just like our minds have depth of intimacy and, and depth, our bodies also follow that. And there will be parts of our bodies, like hands, that we can use with strangers. You shake hands with strangers all the time. Imagine you go to the bus and you start hugging strangers. How would you feel about that? 
wouldn't you run away a little bit? Wouldn't you say that that is a bit invasive? Because not all our body parts are the same. And we share the external, have something to do with how external and how internal they are. Because hands are quite external, hands and feet are quite external, peripheral. Um, our body, when you hug somebody, you have to touch the body with the center of your body. It's a bit more intimate, a bit more, a, a bit deeper. So spontaneously, this is, this is important, spontaneously, we share our peripheral parts of our bodies with the strangers. The more that person is close to us, the, the more we can share parts of our body that are a bit more, more central, more intimate. But now that I propose another, another choice to you, or he and I propose this choice, now you can tell me, okay, I don't agree with you, I still like Descartes' idea that you can be yourself without your body, because your body is something not essential to you, it is not part of you, it is simply something you are using. So we have two paradigms here, your body is something you are, your body is something you have. The question is which one of the two is more true? And this is not something you can put at the microscope and try to analyze what, what is the fact. But I invite you to think about this. Okay, let us, this lady has been raped, this rapist, rapist is an expert, so he rapes uh, very cleanly, very nice, there is no, no wounds, no harm, so this lady goes to the police, the police says, oh, you have been raped, okay. Let us examine, there is hardly any physical harm. Therefore, we caught the guy, we are going to find him whatever is in the law for physical, uh, physical assault. Because the police happen to be very Cartesian, they happen to buy into a dualistic paradigm that your body is something you have. And therefore, whether he punches you in the nose or he rapes you is the same. It is a physical assault to the body and nothing more than that. How many people in the world will buy that? Certainly not women. Why? Because any woman knows that the assault to the intimacy of the person, the intimacy of the body of the person, is an assault to the intimacy of the person. Why? Because our bodies are not something we have, are something we are. And if that is true, the intimacy of your body stands for the intimacy of the person. And this is why, in, once again, the same principle here, in every legislation, in every country, in every culture, in every religion, that has a little bit left, some common sense left, they will penalize far more rape than any other physical assault. Why? Because it is not the same to assault just the body than to assault the physical, the intimacy of the body. Okay, if that is more reasonable, then what else can we say? It turns out that we not only speak with our, lang with our cultural languages, we also speak with our bodies. As a matter of fact, you understand your dog, you have a dog or your cat. You, well, how do you do that? Not because your cat or your dog speaks English very well, but because you observe the body. And the body tells you what he's communicating to you. And not only that, your dog is also reading your body more than your English. <laughs> to know what, uh, to guess what you want. Some people are, they, 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 they tell the dog to come here, and they sound that like they're scolding the dog. The dog only listens the scolding, doesn't listen. Dogs don't understand English very well, but they understand the body, the language of the body very well. Which means that we all have a language of the body. Think about the smiles, for example. You're blind people, born blind, they smile as well. Which means that smiling is not something we learned in our culture. Is something ingrained and innate. So does a smile, does a smile communicate something? Obviously yes, right? You know what the person, how the person feels about what you're saying because of the smile, right? Okay, so it turns out that our bodies speak. They communicate. And this language is not cultural, doesn't depend 
on our decisions is something ingrained, is something innate, is something instinctive, and there is nothing we can do about that. We cannot change that. You take a baby and you say, you know, when I hug you, it means I hate you, you run away, and when I kick you, it means I love you. You cannot do that because you cannot change the dictionary of the language of the body. So if this is true, if hugs, smiles, mean something, would, wouldn't the sexual act mean something? And if the sexual act means something that is concrete and it is independent of your intentions, so your, your smile is independent, the meaning of your smile or your hugs is independent of your intentions. If you are hugging a baby, he will get the message of the hug, even if you are lying to him. Say, I will pretend that I like him and you hug him, he will understand the message. You are still sending that message, even if it is not true. You may be lying to the baby with your hug, but the baby still gets the message. Why? Because our bodies understand bodies. Our bodies communicate. Animals and humans, they share this common language. So if that is true, then the sexual act will have a meaning by itself. What could that meaning, meaning be? Shouldn't that meaning be, well, well, we are uniting the most intimate aspect. We said the intimacy of the body stands for the intimacy of the person. What does, what does that mean? So if we are uniting our intimacies, and our intimacy is intimacy. The word intimacy comes from uh, Latin intimus, which means innermost. Which means if we think that our sexual organs are the innermost part of our bodies that stands for the intimacy of the person, then that is what they communicate. So that I'm uniting with you my most intimate aspect of myself to your most intimate aspect. So it has a meaning by itself. But something we can do about meanings that is quite interesting, and we can lie with it. We can lie with our words. This is the boy that cried wolf, and that is a lie, right? What, what makes a lie a lie? That you are saying something that it is not a fact. He was saying, wolf, he was crying wolf, but there was no wolf. The purpose is obviously so that people come here trying to help me and I have a laugh about that. Okay, so we can lie with our words, can we lie with our bodies? That's a very good example. When Judas kissed Jesus, what was Jesus' reaction? With a kiss you betray your master. What does that mean? That this kiss was a lie. Kisses are typically, depending on your culture, but more or less, typically means you are my friend. You don't betray your friend. So you are using the same, the same action to communicate totally the opposite of what it means. But still, the message was sent. It is just because it is not a fact, Judas was lying with his body. Judas was lying with this kiss. So, let us conclude for now. Our bodies communicate naturally with a language predetermined by nature that we cannot change. We, do ha we don't have the capacity to change the dictionary of the body. And our bodies communicate intimacy for us when they use the sexual language. Our minds can add new messages, as it was in the case of Judas, who told other people, the man I kiss, that's the man you should apprehend. And new meanings to the predetermined meanings. Even if we add a new purpose to the language of the body, it still sends the fixed meaning it is meant to communicate. So people who were looking at Judas will say, oh, that is Judas' friend. But because it was not the fact, Judas was lying. So, we know lessons now from the fat guy. We have lessons from Sophia Yusuf. What are the lessons we can learn? That my body is not something I have, it is something I am. The implications of that is that the intimacy of the body stands for the intimacy of the person, that these bodies communicate, and the intimacy of the body communicates the intimacy of the person.
Okay, trying to put all these things together. So if you put René Descartes and you put Jeremy Bentham together, you put this idea that my body is totally accidental to me, it is not something I am, it's something I have, and then morality depends only on the consequences. This is the coherent conclusion that you can do whatever you want with your body as long as you don't hurt anyone. This is a valid conclusion of these two premises. The question is, are these two premises right? So we can move forward, if we can. Lessons from the fat guy and Sofia Yusuf. That the body is an integral when you reflect, think about what the body is, and you think about what morality is, and we put it all together. And by the way, before we put it all together, I want to remind you that you instinctively knew this. You instinctively are very reluctant to post a fat guy, very reluctant to tell your wife, your children, your daughter, your mother to be a prostitute. Okay. But we don't have we don't have a culture that helps us to verbalize these questions. And this is what I hope to do today. So the body is the body is can we go back please? So, the body is an integral aspect of the person, the intimacy of the body stands for the intimacy of the person, and the body communicates with a fixed language that we are not free to change. When we communicate what we know not to be true, we are lying. When our bodies communicate an intimate union, but that union is not the case, the bodies are lying. To choose to lie with the intimacy of our bodies as a means to any other end is immoral for what we said about morality, because the end does not justify the means, so prostitution, which is using the intimacy of the body to earn money, is immoral. Which somebody said something like that, but still you have to question why intimacy, why intimacy is important. Because only what is, in, what is intimate is always personal. And what is personal should never, be, should never be used as a means to the end. Think about this, we have uh, relationships some of these relationships are personal. Mother, father, mother, mother, children, parents, filial relationships, friendships. If you have a friend and your friend tells you, you know why you are my friend? Because you always pay for dinner. Do, con do you consider that a good personal relationship? Yes? Yes? No, why? Because you are using something that is personal for other ends. And when you use something personal, you use the persons involved in this relationship. It means that it is not your friend. You are just using that. Think about marriage. Somebody says, you know, you, I, you know why I married you? So that I can have citizenship in this country. Wouldn't you consider that immoral? The reason why, because marriage is a personal relationship, but you are using this relationship not, not as an end in itself, but as a means to other end, the means to gain citizenship. Which means you are using this, which means you are using the persons in the relationship. And using persons is always immoral. And this is why prostitution is immoral. So we are going to take a break. But before we take the break, I want to, you to realize, before we go to part two, why I am very reluctant to say, why is masturbation wrong? Why is, because it just took me one hour to tell you why prostitution is wrong, which you already knew. So explaining any other thing, with, without going through the steps and th without going through the reasons why we are asking the question in the first place, is not answering the question, at least I think, it's not answering the question properly. So, we haven't solved the problem. We only talk about prostitution. We have many other things to talk about. Okay, so for that, we need a break. We think uh, we break in, uh, we come back in 10 minutes and I wait for you here. See you, bye. Are you changing with your decisions? That's the right question. 
The second question is we shouldn't treat our bodies as something that is uh, instrumental, something that is accidental. It is something that we are and therefore... By the way, if you are Christian, you should not believe René Descartes. Thomas Aquinas famously said, I am not my soul. Christians, Christianity b began with understanding that the body of Jesus is Jesus. We don't believe only in the mortality of the soul. Every other religion believes that. What is unique about Christianity is that the resurrection of the body of Jesus is the resurrection of Jesus. The body of Jesus is Jesus. We are the only religion that believes in the importance of the body. That my soul goes to heaven is not me enough. To be me, I need my body back. This is why Christians believe in the resurrection of the body. But that's extra. So if you are Christian, it is incompatible with believing what Descartes believed about the body. But you still can choose to say, I am not Christian and I like the René Descartes. But you have to be consistent with that. It's like, I, I, I don't care if you are a utilitarian. You can be utilitarian. But then you have to choose. You have to push the fat guy. You can believe in René Descartes. But then if, a if somebody comes and is raped, you have to say, somebody rapes you. <laughs> you have to say, oops, it's just your body. It's nothing personal. OK. Now we are going to ask another question is, so. We have concluded that prostitution is wrong. Uh, this is the, the argument about casual sex will be the same. There is no real relationship. There is no personal relationship. So you are still lying with your body. So we leave those two out already. We know why they are wrong. But now you can ask, hey, how about premarital sex? Right? And that's a good question because now we have this relationship. It is a personal relationship. And interestingly, even though people are in the surface still quite utilitarian, I find this conversation very often that we all have, but everybody has, a kind of moral standard about sexual activity. And sometimes friends, you talk to friends, and this particular one was like that, very upset that her ex she just, they just broke up, and then she finds another, now everybody knows about everybody's lives about, because of Facebook. So she found out that, oh, just two weeks after the new relationship, they were having sex. And she was totally outraged. What kind of woman is that? Well, you did it after two months. So where do you draw the line? Why two weeks is too fast? and two months seems to be okay. Isn't that an interesting question? Where do you draw the line? So there are many possibilities. So when you are strangers, we said no, okay. So 10 years married, maybe yes, right? So just married, okay, maybe yes. What about here? Where in the middle do you draw the line? When they exchange numbers, when they visit their future in-laws, when they consent, consent wouldn't, wouldn't work because then two strangers can consent as well. So this is interesting that uh, none of this makes sense if you are purely utilitarian because as long as it is consented and protected, any sexual activity should be okay. So if you are a pure utilitarian, that would be okay. All you need for sex to be okay is consent and protection. The moment you don't have protection, it is horrible, immoral because, of course, you can harm someone because of the lack of protection. So, where do you draw the line? Perhaps the most common is sexual affections. That there is a point in which, in the relationship, in which they become exclusive. So, at this point, we are more than friends. And that seems to ring a bell in, in many people. Because, okay, if we are more than friends, the first Perhaps the first telltale sign that uh, your relationship is moving up towards marriage is that we are now exclusive. Now you don't date anyone, now I don't date anyone, and therefore we are on the road to um, marriage or to deepen our relationship. And perhaps this is a good, a good point. And then after this, once we have decided this, maybe sexual intercourse is okay. But if you think about that, 
then many other things could be could be um, could be per permissible, because married people may also fall in love to, with other person. And they say, "Oh, now I love you more than I love my wife when we were boyfriend and girlfriend." So, if affection justifies sexual activity, then it will justify adultery as well. Uh, uh, homosexual sex would be justified as well. So, is this a right a right boundary? So. There are two answers to this question. I'm going to give you the short answer because the wrong answer takes me two hours. <laughs> so the graphic answer is we said that the sexual organs stand for the intimacy of the person because they are the intimacy of the body. Intimacy means the center of something. When two things come together, what is the last thing that comes that is united? When the two things come to a union, come together, what is the last thing that will be united? Does, this is a very easy question. No, you can, even if you are half asleep, you can still answer that. Imagine two things coming together, right? What would be the last thing that comes that is united? Hmm? They are further apart, they come together, there are two spirals. We said that we are like spirals, we are not like sandwiches, we are like sushi rolls, right? So two spirals come together. First thing they touch is the outside, right? And the last thing will be the very center, right? So, so okay, let me. Okay, it doesn't work for some reason. So, the, the answer would be the last thing that is united is the intimacy of the bodies. That would be the concept, okay? Uh, is this concept something only graphic or something that makes sense? This, some, this lady came and said, oh, I think my boyfriend and I are ready for sex. We love each other very much. Our relationship is exclusive, which is interesting why exclusivity is part of this part of love, this kind of love. And she said, OK, I think we are ready for sex. So I said, OK, good, congratulations. Would you put all your money in his bank account? She said, oh, I never thought of that. Do you think he would be ready to put all his money in your bank account? And she said, I don't think so. So you think you're ready to unite the intimacy of your bodies, and you're not ready to unite your bank accounts. And this is the thing. Which one do you think is more important? And this, this is where the premises matter. Because if your premise is that your body is something you have, then I understand your choice. Because then, obviously, your bank account may seem more important than the intimacy of your body. But if you think that your body is something you are, the intimacy of your body stands for yourself, it means that perhaps you are not ready until you are ready to unite everything else in your lives, including your bank account. And I know that in Singapore, many spouses don't, join, don't have joint bank accounts, but it's part of uniting your lives. As a matter of fact, Dominicans, Father Antonio and myself, unite our bank accounts. <laughs> Which, is, uh, which means that it is more superficial than other aspects of our lives. Uh, Marilyn Monroe is not a very famous uh, philosopher, but she said something I think is very important. She said, I am selfish, impatient, a little insecure, and all that, but if you can handle me at my worst, then sure as hell you don't deserve me at my best. And I think this rings a bell in everybody. Because the, what is marriage? Or what is a true relationship, true loving relationship, if not accepting the other person unconditionally. And what is that if not accepting even the worst of that person? So when you vow that you will accept this person unconditionally, then and only then, the union of the intimacy of the bodies will speak of that reality. And this is exactly what we said the sexual act is. It's an expression, it speaks, communicates something that is already there. And this is why some people think that the only way in which the sexual act speaks the truth is when the persons have vowed in public to each other that I will be for you unconditionally and you will be for me unconditionally. 
And that is exactly what makes marriage. It's not the priest of Miss Marriage, it's not the church of Miss Marriage. What makes marriage marriage is the vows. From now on, I will take you unconditionally in goodness, in, bad, in good times and in bad times, in sickness and in health, all the days of my life. When that is true, when that is a fact, when that readiness to be united is a fact, what the bodies do in bed on the wedding night expresses precisely that. And it will be true. Before that, it will be not that true. Depending on how true that thing is, that relationship is, it will be more or less true, but not until they have honestly said that. And it's important that these vows are witnessed by people. Why? Because in marriage, there is the two persons engaged in rights and duties. And this is why society is responsible or it's accountable. They, ha they are accountable towards, towards society. This is something, we'll talk about this later, uh, next week, but for now it is also important. If I am friends with somebody, I don't need to vow anything. I, know I don't need to involve the government. I don't need to involve society. You make friends with somebody for the first time. You don't go to the city hall and say, hereby we, uh, we decide that we are going to be friends for the rest of our lives. It doesn't matter if society is not involved. It's your personal thing. Why? Because in friendship, there are no rights and duties involved. In marriage, there are. People have children. They have to be responsible for the children. You cannot abandon your spouse because there are rights and duties. Society needs to witness so that society, you are accountable to society that for now, because of your vows, you are now responsible for that person and for the children that will come with it. And this is why the vows need to be public. It is not, marriage is not a private affair between two individuals. It is a social affair and society is involved. And this is perfectly understandable in any culture in which hundreds of people go to the wedding. The wedding is not something that is just in which only two individuals engage. It is something that affects society, makes society, and therefore society is involved as well. So there it is. That's the image I was looking for. So geometrically, in the process of the union of the bodies, their centers are the last thing to be united. They're fully united only when their centers are united. And in the process of the ultimate union of two persons, the centers are the last things to be united. Thus, sexual acts are acts of marriage and are only truthful without, within marriage. And that's the short answer. So this is the explanation. As I said before, I can make the answer a little bit longer when we consider what, why is the love between a man and a woman different from friendships, normal friendships, or the love between a mother and a son, or a father and a son. What makes this love this different? And then only when that love has been fulfilled, then the sexual act is permissible. But that would take me, as I said, a bit more time than the time we have. So for now, this should explain. Uh, the vows is the bar, the bar where we draw the line. And the vows make marriage, and therefore, Marriage is the bar. Where do we draw the line? We draw the line at marriage. But now, if you are still awake, you can realize that that's, that's a very high call. I mean, are you sure? Isn't that a little bit impossible to fulfill? That you are together before marriage, you are so attracted to this person, can you really hold it until marriage? Can you really say, I am worth the waiting. I'm sure all people are worth the waiting, but can you hold it? And the answer is, of course, you cannot. And people may be surprised about that. How can you make that kind of morality that is impossible to fulfill? And this, uh, you, there is a similar conversation between Jesus and Peter, precisely talking about marriage. When Jesus explains his paradigm of marriage, and Peter said, oh, if that is the case, is better not to marry. And then Jesus said, yeah, for men, it is impossible. And that's important because it is absolutely true. Even if you don't believe in God, I can honestly say that this is very difficult, if not impossible. And the reason why it's impossible, it is, it is not because the stand, moral standard is unreasonable. It is because we have the wrong understanding of morality. Why? 
because we have a broken understanding of morality, we need another premise here. We have the premise that morality is only about obligations and prohibitions. That tell me what I should do, tell me what I cannot do, and that's it. That is all that morality is all about. And that is only the 25% of morality. We have lost, in our culture today, 75% of the rest of morality. We tend to think that morality is only tell me what to do, what not to do. That's only one, as I said, one-fourth. Then other three-fourths is how to do it, becoming able to do it, and being able to do it well with excellence. That is the full picture of morality. Once again, it takes me a few days <laughs> to explain this. I'm not going to go through that. Think about you are in a boat, and the boat is sinking. What do you have to do? What do you have to do? Swim? Swim sounds like a good idea. Now imagine you don't know how to swim. Isn't that unrealistic? And this is my point. That yes, of course it is unrealistic if you don't know how to swim because you cannot force yourself to swim in five seconds. But it is not unrealistic because maybe it is good that if you are going in a boat and there are chances that the boat sinks, maybe it's a good idea that you learn to swim. Is that sound, does, does that sound very unrealistic? No, obviously. But the problem is that swimming is a skill. We are not born with the skill of swimming. We have to acquire the skill of swimming. And we have lost that for morality. There is a section of morality that used to be called virtues, that we have put under the carpet of obligations that on top of the Ten Commandments you have to be humble, you have to be generous, you have to be chaste. Virtues are not obligations, are skills to become better persons. And that all skills are dispositions that you need to acquire. Nobody is born with dispositions. Nobody is born virtuous. And therefore, if you don't have the virtue, I agree with you, it is impossible. If you have the virtue, it is very possible. So imagine yourself in the boat, everybody is screaming to you, swim, swim, swim. You see, yeah, if you don't know, it is impossible. But if you do, it is just another day in the office. It is actually very simple. But if we have lost that, that understanding in morality, that there are skills out there that we absolutely need in order to attain the moral standard, then things become a bit more believable. So first of all, Virtues are acquired empowerments, skills to become better persons. We have to practice them, we have to acquire them. They are not going to come instantly, they are not going to come because we will them. Okay. Then virtue morality versus obligation morality. So yes, we have obligations, but we need the skills to fulfill those obligations. And then virtue morality versus consequentialist morality, that morality is not only about what happens to the world, it's about what happens to us. Virtues is are what makes us better persons. Versus are, virtues are changes in ourselves. If I become a generous person, I change. If I become a chaste person, I change. And that is what morality really is all about, the change in the person. So, why do we need, what do we need to learn in this regard? First of all, we are not born with skills and we are not born morally neutral. This is very important. We owe this discovery to St. Augustine. Not by chance, St. Augustine was struggling with lustful desires. And he knew very well that we are not neutral, morally speaking. That we are not born neutrally placed between good and evil. What is easier, to be generous or to be greedy? What is easier, to be chaste or to be lustful? What is easier, to be a glutton or to, be, to practice uh, fasting? Obviously, we are not neutrally placed among those two options. And this is, I think, a very insightful discovery of Christianity that we owe the world. We have a more, in my opinion, a more realistic understanding of the human condition. That we are made for goodness. We are all inclined to do good. But we are incapable of doing it well. We are like handicapped people trying to walk properly. We want to walk in that direction, but when we try, we find ourselves trying very hard to do it well. That's exactly the human condition. We are inclined to do good, to know the truth, to will the good. Nobody is inclined to do evil. 
No woman woke up in the morning and said, I want to be the best abortionist in life. I'm going to get pregnant 20 times so that I can have 20 abortions. Nobody is that evil. The only reason why some women go for abortion is because the end may justify the means, not because I want to do evil for evil's sake. We all, Thomas Aquinas said, we only sin under the aspect of goodness. We only sin because we want some goodness and we don't know how to do it well. So we are inclined to do good, but at the same time, we, are, we find ourselves incapable of attaining that good. That is the most realistic apprehension of uh, the human condition in morality, and we owe this to St. Augustine many, many hundreds of years ago. Which means, for our purposes today, that we are not neutrally placed between being chaste and being lustful. That it is, we are all born with lustful desires. And therefore, if we want to love properly, we need to acquire the virtue of chastity. If you want, you have to have, if you are going to have many activities in the sea, maybe it is good for you to learn to swim. If you are going to have deep relationships, maybe it is good for you to acquire the virtue of chastity. So, first of all, what is lustful desires? Many people think that lustful desires is too much sexual desires which is very wrong. So first of all, lustful desires is the lack of sexual desires. It's not the excess, it's the lack of it. You think about sexual desires neutrally, when they start to emerge in our lives somewhere in when we were teenagers. What is attractive is not something of the person, it's the person. So the sexual desires, naturally, as we are made, is a force that pulls us towards the other person. Sexual desires are personal by their very makeup, by their very nature. Lustful desires are impersonal. I want that body, I want to use that body, but I don't want the person. I want something in this relationship, but I don't want the person. That is why lustful desires are morally wrong. They are not morally wrong for what they pursue, they are morally wrong for what they reject they reject the person in the relationship. They want to use you for sexual or emotional gratification. And that is why they are bad. And because we have the by default disintegration, we all lack enough dominion over ourselves to be free from the tendency to use persons for sexual gratification. As I said before, we are not neutrally placed. It is far easier to be lustful than to be chaste. We all suffer from some distortion in our sexual desires and their goodness should not be taken for granted. There is nothing wrong about sexual desires. There is nothing good about lustful desires. And this is why we need chastity. Last question for today, before we end. Okay? Last juice power, the brain juice in the, in the, for tonight. So this is the question, to be meaningful, a gift needs to be A, B, or C. To be meaningful is not to be valuable, okay? Valuable is how much it costs, how much you have to pay for it. Meaningful is how much meaning it has. Does it make sense? Okay, some people can give you a meaningful gift and it is not very valuable and vice versa, okay? So, what does the meaning depend on? Three choices, A, B, or C. To be meaningful, a gift needs to be valuable in itself, B, valuable for the receiver, C, valuable for the giver. How many people say A, no A's, how many B's, so many B's, how many C's? <laughs> Not many C's. Okay, let, let us solve the problem. Okay, don't worry, I will, we are going to solve this problem. So, uh, let us be... So I have a machine in my house, and I, this machine makes diamonds. I can make 100 of them. So and I'm going to give diamonds to each one of you before breakfast. Dun, 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 dun. How meaningful is that? You receive the diamond, very valuable. OK. You can sell it and get a lot of money. How meaningful is that to you? A lot? Not much. Which one? Very much? Not very much. 
Not very much. Okay. Second scenario, I am a priest. We only give us ourselves $200 a month. So, and I, I, am, I know you, and I really think that you are the most wonderful person in the world. I have been saving to buy a diamond for 20 years. Since I arrived to Singapore, I'm thinking about you. This month, I will earn, I will save $10. Next month, $80. After 20 years, I managed to have money enough to buy this diamond for you. And there I go, and I give it to you. How meaningful is that? Very meaningful. If you receive that diamond, you freak out, and you change your country, because <laughs> you said, what kind of priest is this, right? Why do you do that? Because it has a lot of meaning. So the answer is? What is the answer? A, B, or C? In the first case, it was not very valuable for me. And therefore, it was not meaning, meaningful. The second case, it was very valuable for me. I had been saving for 20 years. Very, very valuable for me. And therefore, it has a lot of meaning. So the answer is C. C and we can understand that. B is because, OK? But so the same thing happens with sex. Sex is very valuable. It's like diamonds, very valuable in itself. It has a lot of meaning in itself. But it has no value for me. For the giver, it will have no meaning for the receiver. Does it make sense? It's just like diamonds. So what is chastity? Chastity is about making valuable for me what is in itself very valuable. Because if it is valueless for me, it is going to be meaningless when I give it. Does it make sense? It should. Okay. So Even, even if the authentic sexual act is precious and meaningful in itself, we can cheapen it as a meaningful act when we cheapen it for ourselves. And this is something that utilitarianism or consequentialism cannot understand because it is about what happens to us, not what happens in the world. How can people cheapen their sexuality? That is exactly what lustful desires do, makes our sexual acts cheap. It is just business, it is just entertainment, it is just scratching an itch. So now and only now I can answer the question. I'm not going to answer the question, but this is what typically comes to me. Why is masturbation wrong? Why is premarital sex wrong? We all went through prostitution, uh, casual sex, uh, premarital sex. What about these two? Once again, I hope now we understand this is my point. I don't want you to convince of anything. I want you to think. The title of the, the, the talk was thinking about sex rather than talking about sex, because there is a lot of talk without thinking. So today we spend two hours thinking, and this is the, my conclusion. Depends. If you are a consequentialist, there is nothing wrong with that, because there are no bad consequences. And the good consequences certainly um, outweigh the bad consequences. So it does not harm anyone. It is consensual. It has some benefits. So therefore, nothing is wrong with that. That is if you have that premise. Now, think about if you have the other premise. If you have learned something from the fat guy and from uh, Sophia Yusuf, then the question will be very different. The question is not, and this is why I refuse to answer the question. When people ask me, why is pornography wrong? What they're expecting is, tell me what bad consequences it has. And you can think about bad consequences, and now many people think about, use that, and they talk about the brain and how the brain is rewired and all these things, which only strengthens the consequentialist mentality. But if you think that morality is not about what you, how you change the world, but how you change yourself, and you think that you can only attain the moral standard when you have acquired the virtues that empower you to do it, and you think that you want to be a virtuous person, the question changes a lot. Because if you ask anyone, even if he doesn't believe in God, even if he believes that there is nothing wrong with this, but if you change the question and you tell him, hey, I want to be a chaste person. What is chastity? Once again, we said, I didn't say, but it was in the slides. Chastity is the education of your sexual desires to put them at the, se at the service of love. Why? Because if you don't do that, we are not born neutral about sex. If you don't do that, you will sacrifice your love 
to satisfy your lustful desires. That is the by default human disposition. This is why if you want a meaningful sexual relationship, you cannot do it without chastity. So what we are presuming, what the church, when the church writes catechisms or things like that, presumes all this, all this that we don't presume in our societies today. It presumes that you know what morality is all about. It presumes that you want to be a virtuous person. And therefore, now the question is very different. Do you think that masturbation is an act of lust or an act of chastity? Isn't the answer a bit easier to give now? Do you think that masturbation or porn, or watching porn, consuming porn, helps you to be chaste or prevents you to be chaste? So, um, it's up to you. You have to answer that question. But I hope that you see that the question is very different. The answer to this question will be very different from that question. And this is really where we are today. Many people come from here and they expect me to say all the bad consequences. And once again, I hope you understand me. This was all about me. <laughs> Why I don't want to say anything? Because rather than giving a bad answer that you're not going to understand and you say the church has nothing to offer, is first of all, conclusions. This has nothing to do with the church. It has something to do with having lost a sense of morality in a sense of the dignity of the human body that we have lost in the 14th century when we talk about morality, 19th century when we talk about consequentialism, and the 17th century when we talk about the dignity of the body. And this all comes, it is not surprising that it goes, all happened in Western culture. It is not surprising that all these ideas, that all you need for sex to be okay is consent and protection, comes from Western ideas, because these are Western premises. So as I said before, this has nothing to do with the church, sorry about this. Uh, it has to do with two cultural dogmas of Western culture, a consequentialist morality and a dualistic understanding of the human body. Both views, the traditional view and the new Western view, have valid conclusions from opposing premises. Both of them are very consistent. So now you have to choose your premises and be consistent. Every culture has dogmas that people impose on themselves. Every dogma needs to be questioned. And we are not very good at that. This is what I hope to achieve tonight. That we have to do is question our dogmas. It's not about accepting everything just because everybody does it should be OK. Maybe you should think, do I, do I want to, to do this? Is this something that is really true? So choose your premise critically and wisely. And I have finished. If you want this talk, it is available in that uh, QR code. And if uh, you don't uh, want it, or you then, but you want to help Family Life Society, then you scan this other one, and you give them money. OK, we have five minutes for questions. Uh, we have to leave this place by in 10 minutes, exactly, before that. So I will to take only the questions that I can take. And if you have more questions, we still have one more session. We assumed what we know now for the sexual act. The question is about fertility, why uh, contraception is wrong, and why IVF is wrong. If children are very good, IVF should be right. And if children are not, if we can we shouldn't accept every pregnancy, maybe contraception uh, should be permissible. Okay, so we'll answer those questions and more, uh, but for now, any other clarifications in order of making this a bit more fruitful? Anything that I said, once again, I could take much longer to go step by step and it's going into depth in every of the steps I, I gave here, but this is what I can do in one hour. Any clarification that is needed, please, let me know. Yes, no. Anything you, me, you need me to repeat in order to be a bit more clear? 
Yes. The internet union. About the internet union. Yes. Why is it restricted to only one person? Okay. It is the as I said before, one of the characteristics of of the romantic relationship or sexual relationship is precisely exclusivity. And why exclusivity? Or why in most cultures, interestingly, even in polygamous cultures, it is an exclusive, it starts as exclusive relationship. Even in polygamous cultures, people don't date three people at the same time. So, which means that when they start the relationship, this is exclusive. And then they include another person, but it is also exclusive. In, in, a, in a way. So why is exclusivity part of that? And the answer is because of the totality of this gift. Because of the totality in the relationship. I don't want something of you, I want all of you. And if I want all of you and you want all of me, nobody can be included there. This doesn't happen in, uh, in the fraternal or parental relationships. You love all your children and you are open to love more children. And of course, what that means is that the, the relationship is not reciprocal. Parents don't love children in the same way that children love parents. You cannot have that reciprocity. To have that re re reciprocity, it has to be exclusive. You cannot, I cannot give myself to three wives and then the three wives give themselves to me. That would be Unfair. I cannot give myself totally to three wives. I can give myself partially to three wives. And therefore, the, re the relationship will not be reciprocal. So if what is specific about this is one of the things I, I, I said I, I needed more time to say what is unique about this love between a man and a woman. And what is unique, and this is once again across cultures, is exclusivity. But we have to ask ourselves, why is this exclusivity there, which is your question. And the question, the answer is because this, what is unique about this love is the totality of, the totality in this love. That I want all of you, and therefore I'm not ready to share you with anyone, like somebody did in the newspapers lately. And therefore, if I want to be consistent, then I shouldn't share myself with other people because I want all of you, you should want all of me. It is just one characteristic of this love. Does it? You understand that? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, we don't. I mean, we don't love chakutiao, dogs, friends, and spouses. The same thing. Hopefully. Love is about the most confusing word in the English dictionary, so we have to be very careful about that. In other languages, distinguish many words for that, so it's good to always verbalize as much as you can. What do you mean by love? And it's very dangerous when people say God is love, but there's so many yes. different types of love. So yes, God so that's why, well, yeah, good, that's, that's, yes, that's why we have to be as precise as we can when we say love, what do you mean by that? And there are kinds of love. Personal love is not the same as loving fishing, for example. So love between persons is, is you want the good for the other person. That is more or less what friendship is. But in the case of uh, romantic relationships, it, it goes more than that. You don't only want something good for the person. You want the totality of that person. That is what is unique about this kind of love. And because it is total, it needs to be exclusive. And spontaneously, exclusivity is the first thing. So even if you are dating somebody and that person finds out you are dating somebody else or just suspecting that you may be in another very close, in another relationship very close, they will start to suspect that you are not respecting this new standard of relationship. Yes? So notice something that since you mentioned that, I didn't go mention God here. I, I could. So this is what I call philosophy of the body. We can make all theology of the body, but 
once again, we cannot be good Christians if we are not good people. And we use God sometimes to get away with not explaining things in the normal, in the normal, in the human manner. So everything that is sinful, it's morally wrong. Everything that's morally wrong is sinful. It's the same thing. So when we say that stealing is wrong, we don't appeal to God to say that the stealing is wrong. We appeal to human dignity, to private property, the same thing. So of, of course, because stealing is humanly wrong, God says so. And it is also a sin. It is the same thing. A sin and something immoral is the same thing. Everything that is immoral is a sin. Everything that is a sin is immoral. And therefore, we need to see the immorality of it so that we can understand why the church says it is a sin. So it's not that I want to exclude God. So God, as you said before, once you understand this and you bring God into the picture, everything fits even better. But even without God into the picture, it should be just good enough what the church has always called um, natural moral law, which once again many people misunderstand. In the, I started to talk about physicalism. Many people understand that just because it is that way, it means it has to be that way. And that is not what moral, natural moral law is. So just, uh, just to, to, to relate to that. Yes? Uh, I have one minute of what is interesting about cohabitation is it doesn't work. And this is something sociologists know, that if you take a, a, a poll and you realize how many people cohabitated, people who have cohabitated, they have far more chances of divorce than people who don't. And this doesn't make any sense to many people, even sociologists. It doesn't make sense because what you mentioned, it makes perfect sense. I mean, if you want to buy a car, how long are you going to go have the car? 10 years? Don't you want to try the car first? Don't you want to drive around to see if you like the car? Very good. So when you have tried all the car and then, yo, that, I think it fits me, then I'm going to commit and buy whatever the car. So that's, that's, that's the meaning of that. I don't have time, so the answer is, if you choose your car, if you choose your spouse and you choose your car, you risk scrap your spouse that you scrap your car. That's why, that's why people who cohabitate divorce, have a higher uh, rate of divorce than people who don't. Because this is a personal relationship. I don't choose my mother, I accept my mother. There are many things wrong about my mother, now many more. Or my, my brother, certainly, right? But that's, that's what personal relationships are all about. I'm going to accept you as you are. I'm not going to pick and choose. That's not how we choose cars. I don't say I will embrace you and love you all the days of my life. The car is there to suit my needs. The moment it doesn't suit my needs, I substitute it, I substitute it for a better car. And today, in, which, in a world, in a utilitarian world, in, we, in which we think that personal relationships should be the same as the other relationship, we tend to think about the spouses, someone who has to satisfy me. Obviously, there will be a point in which they don't. And therefore, what is, it, what is the option? Okay, then I will choose another car. I will choose another spouse. That is the reality that sometimes sociology doesn't see, but it is actually, once again, it is a fact. It is not uh, something that the church invented. So they know that and they try to make sense of that. And the sense is, yes, it is a different kind of choice. I didn't look at my mother when I was born and say, I don't like that lady, can I take that lady? No. I accepted her, she accepted me, she then looked at me, can I choose another baby? No, that is what personal relationships are all about. I'm going to accept you as you are, in goodness and in badness, in good times and in bad, sickness and health, all the days of your life. And that is why, once again, that is not, when you intend to cohabitate, you don't want that. What you are doing is testing the other person, whether that person satisfies you or you satisfy that person. And that test, that mentality, is a shopping mentality. It is not a commitment mentality. And therefore, you will behave. And what comes, what comes after will ensue after that, once again. 
more consumeristic mentality. So uh, we have finished. You have quest more questions. Uh, we have more uh, one more session next uh, week. Uh, see you. Good night. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without them. Amen. Thank you. Father, thank you. Father. Thank you.